Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, August 16th, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> Does anyone else just wake up and hear the news and just think, wow, really? Th these things are happening? This kind of stuff's happening? It seems like we've become so jaded with some of the things we hear, you know, mass shootings, big attacks, major killing sprees, all kinds of things, and we just kind of go, eh, right? We need to remember to remain compassionate, to be mindful of others, no matter what they're going through. I'm seeing, you know, with all these shootings and things, it, there's, again, the big battle. Oh, we got to stricter gun laws. We got to do away with guns. I've seen some of the Democratic presidential hopefuls saying they will have an executive order to where they do away with guns completely. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I mean, I guess most law-abiding citizens would probably abide by the law, but criminals don't abide by laws. They would still have guns. They would still shoot the unarmed masses. Guns are not the problem. Just want to make that clear. Because if guns are the problem of all violence, then pencils are the reason for mathematical mistakes and forks make people fat. Okay? Not the person holding the fork, not their fault, it's the fork's fault. Out of the Hill, Trump said, Trump vows to always uphold the Second Amendment amid ongoing talks on gun laws. President Trump told supporters in New Hampshire he would always uphold the Second Amendment and suggested that the construction of new mental health facilities would help curb gun violence. Um, he said, it's not the gun that pulls the trigger. It's the person that pulls the trigger. And the crowd roared in approval. It's true. Guns don't kill. People kill. You see, it's not a gun problem. It's a heart problem. It's a sin problem. It's a problem with people who don't value life. To those who don't care to uphold the laws. Thomas Jefferson said, Americans should have a right to bear arms, a right to have guns, to not only protect ourselves from invading foreigners, but to protect ourselves from a tyrannical government. You know, the Bible speaks of a government coming upon the earth. It'll be a one world government, one world religion. The Bible speaks explicitly of this in Daniel and Revelation, other places. So we know it's coming. We know it's coming. Sure, there are things that have to happen prior to that. <laughs> Number one, Donald Trump won't be president when this happens, pretty sure, because he's all about America and protecting our freedoms and making America great again. A one-world religion and a one-world government, which is the global plan of many, the elitist. And it's one of those things you might say, no, 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 we can't do that. Well, it will happen because God said it will happen in his word. So we know it will happen. So when we see it happening, those of us who know scripture, even though we're not going to like that it's happening, it has to come. It has to come prior to the return of Christ. So, we have to ask God to give us wisdom and guidance and discernment so we know how to react to these things that we know are coming. Because we don't want to pray against God's will, right? If something, if God wills something to happen, should we pray against it? You think he's going to answer your prayer if you're praying against his will or against his plan? We just need to pray for the wisdom and the guidance to, to continue on in strength. 
Out of Times of Israel, the U.S. said to be coordinating secret Iran talks between Israel and the Emirates. Washington is telling uh, WSJ that there are secret meetings that go further than recent symbolic gestures aimed to deepen military and diplomatic cooperation between the United States and the Emirates against Iran. America and Israel are forming allies to help fight against Iran. Again, Ezekiel 38 tells us all about this war, these enemies of God that come against Israel. A lot of things happening in Iran right now. Out of Yahoo, Iranians struggle with U.S. sanctions as currency hits all-time low. Currency hitting an all-time low in Iran. I mean, at some point, the Iranian government will be like, hey, what do we have to lose? Let's, let's attack Israel before we're totally devastated here. We know Iran leads a world army against Israel in Ezekiel 38, 39. Of course, we also know how that ends. We know the victor. We know how Israel burns the enemy's weapons for seven years. Nuclear weapons could burn for seven years. Out of the Times of Israel, Trump backs decision to bar two Democratic lawmakers, claims he didn't press Israel. You know, we're hearing so much about this um, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib um, being banned from Israel. We're hearing a lot about it. And it's, it's kind of funny, actually. Um, hearing all this talk about it. Um, you hear both sides, you know, many people praising Israel, a lot of people condemning Israel. I think they did the right thing. There's so many people saying, oh, well, you must have something to hide if you're not letting people in. Well, you know, if you only mean to harm Israel, they definitely did the right thing. And both of those women didn't have any meetings with Israeli officials. They weren't going to tour any government areas. They were just going to advance their agenda to have boycotts and divestments and sanctions against Israel. Bringing lies to the table. Oh, Israel's doing this and doing that, which most likely would be lies. President Trump backs the decision. He backs it completely. I just wish we could ban them here in America, too, because they're, they're not good for America either. Both women have, they were sworn in on the Quran, so they're Muslim, so they can't even assimilate in a democracy like ours. And they continue to speak against America. They speak against Israel. They speak against anything it goes against Islam. I saw where Ilhan Omar had passed a, had come up with a resolution with this huge tax on pork products, making them so expensive that no one would buy them. Yeah, uh, this is America. We're going to eat bacon. We're going to eat pork chops. We're going to eat ham. If you don't like it, feel free to not eat those things. But don't tell us we can't. Just amazing to me. Um, out of the Times of Israel, banned Congresswoman calls decision insult to democracy and a sign of weakness. Really? Because Islam and democracy don't get along. Islam has its own set of laws and rules. And a democracy where the majority rules doesn't fit in with Islam. Ilhan Omar has told people time and time again, Muslims, we, we don't assimilate. We didn't come here to assimilate. Yeah, they came here to spread their cult however they can, by the sword, by immigration, by blinding those who don't know the truth, 
called it a sign of weakness. I actually think it's a sign of strength. We're saying, you know what? You mean us harm, so you can't come here. Sorry. That's a sign of strength. Bashing democracy. Just amazing. The times we're living in, it's just... It's all kinds of things. Every time you turn around, you know, there's such an amazing miracle that Israel is. Israel's quite a miracle. I've often said Israel is the barometer of Bible prophecy. You know, Jeremiah tells us, according to his prophecies, that we're seeing a bigger miracle now than even the parting of the Red Sea. I mean, and so many people are missing it. it it's happening now. It's here. It kind of gives us this, this incredible, overwhelming evidence for God's existence, for his love, for his plan, and it, it proves his word is true. But instead of being amazed at this miracle and finding joy and comfort in it, most people just practically deny it. You know, they, they choose instead to hold on to false doctrine. And, and mistakes based on the idea that God doesn't always keep his word, which goes against God's word. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, God warned Israel that he'd punish them, that he would scatter them around the world, right? He promised that he would eventually bring them back to the land, not because they repented of their sin, but for the honor of his name. Israel is regathered right now. I mean, look how God describes it. Ezekiel 36 tells about Israel's sin, its dispersion, and then God bringing Israel back to the land, promised to Abraham. I mean, that chapter makes it obviously clear that he'll first regather the nation of Israel into the land. Then he will bring about that nation's spiritual rebirth. You know, Jews have been turning to Jesus since the first disciples. But national conversion takes place after the final regathering. You know, Ezekiel 36, 24 through 26 says to Israel, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And then in Ezekiel 37, God talks about the process with that valley of dry bones. This valley of dry bones. You know, those people, they're dead. You know, they're beyond dead. The, the, their bones are dry. They're dead dead. <laughs> um, then God begins to, to pull those bones together, and then he puts flesh on them. You know, and eventually the bodies are made whole again, but they're still dead. And then at the final step, he breathes into them the breath of life. That's about the regathering of Israel. You know, in Jeremiah 16, verses 14 and 15, God himself compares this miracle to the miracle surrounding Israel's deliverance from Egypt, including the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north, from all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. Jeremiah 23, verse 7 and 8. Bigger miracle. These dry bones, millions of dry bones, the sinew and the flesh being added to the bones. And then one day they'll have the breath of life. I mean, think about this. Think if, if that vision of these dry bones was literal. What an amazing miracle that would be. We would be seeing a miracle unlike the world has ever seen. But God is pulling these bones together. He is putting flesh on them. And I am quite certain that soon they will have new hearts inside those bodies and he will breathe life 
into them. You know, Israel coming back has been promised over and over in the Bible. But there's so many people who hold on to this false doctrine of replacement theology, which is from the devil himself. Christians have not replaced Israel. God doesn't go back on his word. God doesn't lie. He cannot change. Um, some people think that the promises God made to Israel aren't true. But Titus 1, verse 2, Numbers 23, 19, 1 Samuel 15, 29, all tell us that God can't lie. Hebrews 6, 17 through 18 says that God's word's immutable. 2 Timothy 2, 15, God's word's the word of truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus himself said that he is truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth in John 17, 17. Jeremiah 31 Verse 35, thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night? The Lord of hosts is his name. I mean, if this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. This fixed order departs from before me. The sun hasn't stopped shining, has it? It's still burning continuously, right? then God didn't replace Israel with Christians or anyone else. God doesn't go back on his word. Christians are grafted in. Okay. We're grafted in. We're not replacing anything. God doesn't replace Israel. He will fulfill his promises, and he's doing it right now. And we're watching this happen. The bones are lining up. The cartilage is forming together. The muscles, the tissue, it's, it's being added. Those damn dry bones are coming to life. And we're watching it happen. People, you need to read the Bible. You need to get into the Word. John 8, verse 31. What does Jesus say? John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word. You know, I'm, I'm one of these guys. I, I, I like to work out. I like to go to the gym. I'm active. I like to stay fit and you know, try to stay in shape. I'm hoping someday to get to play with my grandkids and, uh, you know, watch them grow up, good Lord willing. But I know a lot of people who just hate going to the gym. They're like, nah, you're not getting me to the gym. I've got friends that are like, yeah, I like to work out, but sometimes I just, you know, not feeling it. And I get that. There's many times when I'm at the gym going through the rigors of whatever I'm doing and I'm sitting there thinking I'm not feeling it today. But I press on. I press through. Um, and then when I'm finished, I'm glad I didn't quit. You know, I think that's what it's like for some people to study the Bible. You know, there, there are times when they really want to sit down and read it. They look forward to it. Then there's times when they get up and they're like, yeah, I'm just not feeling it today. I'll just skip it today. One day is not going to hurt. Then two days, three days a week, two weeks, month goes by. They haven't read their Bible. It's not about legalism. It's about discipline. It's discipline and obedience. There is a big difference between legalism and discipline. Discipline says, I'm going to read the Bible because I need to do it. I know God wants me to do it, and when I'm done, I'll be glad I did it. Um, legalism says, you have to do it whether you want to or not, whether you like it or not. And it's, it's something we have to determine in our minds to do. You know, even if you don't want to, even before you check your email or before you check your social media post, you have to discipline yourself to do it. Um, discipline yourself. I saw there was a, a study. The Center for Bible Engagement did a study that came up 
was something called the power of four. They said the power of four is evident when we consider that for some of these behaviors like getting drunk or, or sex outside of marriage, they examine there's no statistical difference between Christians who read or listen to the Bible two or three days a week and those who don't engage Scripture at all or only once a week. So if you're not reading your Bible four or more times a week, then you won't make any real different choices or changes than someone who doesn't even read their Bible at all. You reading your Bible four times a week? Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. We need to make sure we see the value of God's word. You know, we need to strive after God's word, to long for it, to seek for it. You know, don't just make it some kind of legalistic, oh, I gotta read it every day. Get in prayer before you read. Ask God to give you wisdom and discernment and guidance to open your heart and open your mind that you might be able to receive his word. In 1 Peter 4, verse 16, 1 Peter 4, 16, it says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know, there's going to come a time in your life, more than anything on earth, when you're going to need to know that God is with you. Okay? And when that moment comes, I think it's very important that you keep your trust in Jesus Christ. You keep your eyes focused. To do less would be to deny or dishonor God. I think that's what Peter's talking about in this verse. When your time of suffering comes, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't dishonor him by doubting him. Now, when Peter wrote this, he might have been thinking that he denied and dishonored the Lord. You know, three times he denied knowing Jesus, even though Jesus had told him ahead of time he would. Of course, when Jesus said, you're going to do this, guess what? You're going to do that. Because <laughs> Jesus knows the end from the beginning. Peter couldn't imagine himself denying the Lord, but it happened, just like Jesus said it would. That's the kind of situation I think Peter's trying to spare us from. It's important to remember also, though, that Christ restored Peter, just like he can restore you and I. So if you've denied or dishonored Christ in the past, God can use you again. We need to pray for the courage, pray for the strength that we don't flinch in the face of trials. That the things that are about to happen won't cause us to turn from our faith. Ask God to strengthen you so that you won't give up on him, or you won't deny him. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, there's a reason why God doesn't take us immediately to heaven when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, okay? I mean, think of all the troubles and the trials and the heartaches that we would escape and the joys we would experience in heaven. But then, who would be here to tell the others the gospel of salvation? Who would be here to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ if all the believers were taken out? So if you're living and breathing currently... <laughs> then God has a purpose for you. He's not done with you yet. He might have a ministry for you to fulfill. And don't think of ministry as something only preachers do in front of the church on Sunday morning, Saturday night, whenever you go to service. Service to God is the responsibility of every believer. You know, it's a matter of doing the good works that God has prepared beforehand for each of us to accomplish, Ephesians 2.10 tells us. Now, we may serve differently uh, and change over time, but we're never called to retire and do nothing. Even a bed-bound saint can pray for people or encourage people that come to visit them in the hospital or in, on their deathbed. A believer's goal should not be simply to attend church and listen to a sermon and throw some money in the plate and then receive enough spiritual food to get you through the week. The goal is to serve God with our whole being, with all that we are, with all that we have, reflecting the love of Jesus through who we are. 
You never know who you might reach. Serving God, loving God and loving others. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength. And the second commandment is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God and loving others are the two greatest commandments of all. How are you doing in that regard? You know, our worship of God and instruction from his word, the Holy Bible, is what edifies us. It's what equips us to serve one another and to go into the world to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Your entire life is meant to be an act of service to God. Many people don't view it that way, but that's what it is. You know, if you're living for your own happiness, your own goals, your own selfish ambitions, you will eventually be disappointed. But when you walk in the good works that God has prepared for you, you're going to have the satisfaction of doing exactly what you were created to do. The joy of the Lord. No one can steal your joy. They can steal your stuff. They can steal your car, your money, your house, your life. But they can't steal your joy in the Lord. People, it's time to serve. It's time to step up and serve. Serve God, serve others. And let's make sure the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ goes all throughout this world as we seek to serve him, as we watch and pray for his return. He's coming back. He promised. He said he was coming back. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's time to serve, people. Step up. Listen, you guys have a great weekend. I love you guys. God bless you. Please go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Take somebody with you. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday.